Hello, everybody. Uh, well, welcome back to our sessions. Uh, we are continuing today's sessions with a dynamic program analysis, and we have the honor to have with us Professor Gobna Kansi. So, a few wor uh, words about Professor Kansi. He's a professor at Indian Institute of Science in the Computer Science and Automation Department. His research interests are primarily in the computer systems area, operating systems, storage systems, system security, and systems verification. He's currently an associate uh, editor of IEEE, Computer Society Letters, and formerly of ACM France on storage. Uh, his education has been at IIT Madras, uh, BTEC in 1977, University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, and Stanford University, where he obtained his PhD in 1988. He has also worked uh, at AMD, Sanita, uh, uh, and he's a postdoc. He was a postdoc until 1989 at Stanford. Uh, without further ado, uh, Professor Kansu, I give the floor to you. Okay. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Is it uh, clearly audible? Yes, you're audible. Okay. Now I'm going to share the screen. So, um, can you can you see the screen? Uh, yes, it's visible. Yes. Okay. I think I'm going to make it uh, full screen. Uh, let's see. Where is the... You don't see it. It's going to be right. uh, okay, I think I'll keep it as it is. But as, it, as long as it is. Uh, where is the full screen? Oh, full screen. Okay. The machine is a bit. Uh, it is spinning. I don't know what it means why it is doing it. There's almost no load on the system. Okay. And this is okay as well. It's uh, it's visible. So. Okay. Okay. Now is it uh, fine? Yes. Okay. Yes. I think I'll get started. Okay. So again, thanks for the introduction. I like to discuss uh, one topic which might be of interest for the for those people who are interested in uh, uh, computer systems security, not only at the level of programming, but also at the level of uh, how one uh, organizes, uh, let's say, large scale systems that depend on computer systems. Okay? So let me just briefly mention what the issue is. Okay? I think uh, you must have heard about what are called zero day attacks. What are those? They're basically uh, bugs in the code, which are, uh, let's say, are out in the open that is uh, it's widely distributed. Uh, but most people don't know that there's a bug in it. And the party who knows that there is a bug in it has an unusual advantage because they can use it to, let's say, get certain benefits of exploiting uh, the bugs to do certain, uh, let's say, profitable things for them. Okay? And, uh, this is a big issue, and uh, oftentimes in the underground world of, uh, uh, let's say, vulnerability, uh, det detecting vulnerabilities in code, so also is treated as intellectual property. I think some of you might also know that uh, this is quite a big issue because even at the level of nations, it can be a problem. For example, there is something called Stuxnet, which uh, you might have heard about, by which uh, uh, some of the uh, programs in Iran, for example, were, uh, let's say, retarded by uh, certain activities, uh, by introducing certain code segments into their uh, nuclear installations. And uh, so in a sense, this is a fairly serious issue. Basically, you have a piece of code, you want to know what it does. Okay? Is it uh, possible for us to find out what can it do and what it cannot do? Or is it possible for us to give it certain inputs and make it do certain things which nobody expected? And I think we'll see a similar situation in, uh, I think some of you might have come across this arms control treaties, right? Basically, when you have two nations have nuclear weapons, they would like to know 
what are the capabilities of each other and they want to negotiate. So uh, essentially here, the usual principle they say is you, you trust the other party, but you verify. You verify the other party has the capability that the party claims to have. Okay? So uh, I think that this is the usual issue, but uh, you can see that uh, the verification can be quite difficult. How does a weak party know that the stronger party has the capability that party claims to have? Okay, it's not an easy thing to figure out uh, uh, because for most of the techniques are uh, secret, etc. So it's not easy. So essentially proof of violation is not possible against a capable adversary. And you will see that in the case of advanced weapons, space weapons, you don't know what the other party has got. Okay? Uh, you can negotiate, but unless you know whether the, whatever that claims is actually true or not, you really don't have a, a clue about what to do. And similarly in the case of uh, computer systems, you have uh, security and what you would like to do is to, uh, let's say, have limited trust but extensive verification of the claims of other parties or the claims of a particular piece of software or of a piece of hardware and software. Okay? You want to have limited trust, but you want to verify it. And oftentimes you'll see in, uh, let's say in the industry, people talk about zero trust architectures. Okay? And uh, this zero trust architectures is uh, an attempt to ensure that uh, you don't have to uh, really trust almost anything and you can depend on only very few things. But the real problem for us is that this uh, uh, architectures require us to be able to verify certain things. And our problem is that if the underlying problem is intractable, that is, it's almost impossible to, in theory, to be able to be certain that the, you can actually verify something, then you have a problem. And surprisingly, it turns out these are very common situations, not unusual. In court segments, uh, it's very difficult to figure out if a particular piece of code is doing what uh, you know you can claim it to uh, do. And this is because there is a fundamental problem called reachability problem. I think some of you who have studied computer science will know that there is something called the halting problem in Turing machines. What is this halting problem? The problem is basically uh, you want to check if a particular uh, machine with given inputs will halt or not. It turns out this is equivalent to the reachability problem. Basically, because you can uh, incorporate this particular halt, uh, halting problem and say, uh, can I reach after this uh, particular, because I said it's going to, whether a particular problem is going to stop or not, right? I put that Excuse problem. Excuse me, uh, Professor uh, Gominath, uh, if your yes. slides do not change, I don't know if... Uh... Okay, no, no, I'm not changing it. I just have the zero, at, zero, okay. zero okay. attacks, right? I'm going to change it now. Okay. So uh, it turns out, that the reachability problem is connected with the halting problem. Essentially, I can incorporate or insert a uh, halting problem. Just after the halting problem, I can say, can I reach that particular point? So if only if I can guarantee that for those, uh, for every input I can halt, then only I can reach to the step that is after that. Okay? So in a sense, the reachability problem, if I can solve it, then I can solve the halting problem. That means the reachability problem also is an undecidable problem. Okay? So in a sense, what's happening is that when you have code segments, the reachability problem is equivalent to the halting problem. So now, uh, unfortunately, it turns out almost all analysis, uh, important analysis in computer systems, uh, many of them are connected to reachability. Okay? And uh, you can see that it is also applicable in uh, more practical situations. Let's take the case of hard pacemaker. Again, can you see the next slide? Have I, I just changed it just now. Hello? You can uh, see no, the next No, still it's not uh, visible, I'm afraid. Can you see the hard pacemaker? It's just the, the first one? slide uh, with the topic of your course. Okay, so I think it is, uh, I changed it to hard pacemaker. Um, I don't know why it's not changed. Okay. Um, and shall I go back and forward and see what happens? Can you see zero day attacks? No, uh, I'm afraid not. Maybe you can move it uh, yeah, manually okay. or close okay. the can you see? Can you see zero day attacks? No? No, no, it's still the first uh, slide. So you're, you're just at the beginning, that is the dynamic program analysis. That's where it is? Yeah, the, uh, just the topic and your name. Uh, okay, not, so you're not seeing anything at all, is it? Okay. So I'm going to restart the whole thing. I'm going to stop the sharing. And yes, restart. of course. Yes. Let's start.
And then I'm going to share the screen again. Let's hope that uh, we can do this. Thing. No? Uh, yes, can you try to move the slides? Ah, uh, yes, now it's moving. Okay. Yes, indeed. Okay. Yes, uh, thank you. Now you can see the zero dot X? Yes, exactly. Okay. So I just mentioned that again, re uh, capitulating, basically summarizing. I mentioned that zero day attacks are basically those attacks which nobody knows about, and uh, it's only few people know it. And they can trade it as IP. And I mentioned that if you look at Stuxnet and those kind of uh, problems, uh, where even Lipton installations could have been uh, held ransom by access to information about code uh, uh, behavior. Okay? And I mentioned that in ARMS control also, you have the same issue. You don't know what the two parties, what the capabilities are, because each one wants to keep the uh, secret about what their capabilities are. And uh, essentially, if you're looking at security in a computer systems context, you need to verify, uh, you want to have limited trust and extensive verification. But our problem is that if the underlying problem is intractable, then we have an issue. I mentioned that reachability is one of those problems, okay, which is a common thing because it's connected with uh, the halting problem. Okay. Uh, do you see the next one? Heart pacemaker? Hello? Yes, indeed. Yes. Okay. So basically, now let's take the case of the uh, second problem. Okay. You have a microprocessor based uh, heart pacemaker, which is with wireless connectivity, let's say. Now, the problem is that because it's wireless and whatnot, is it possible for unauthorized reprogramming or re reading of the parameters? Okay. Is it possible that somebody can tap into the network, somehow launch an attack on this heart pacemaker and be able to read certain parameters or worse, they can reprogram the device. And uh, because this can be quite critical because with heart pacemaker, you don't want anybody else to have access to what's happening in this particular uh, heart pacemaker. So one solution is of course, some people have proposed a firewall device for pacemakers and things like insulin pumps. And the issue for us is that uh, we need to add one more device now. It's not just uh, the heart pacemaker. You have to add one more device. Again, that has to reside in your heart. Uh, uh, so it's going to be sort of a, not an easy thing to think about. Okay? So ideal thing would be to show that the code is correct. It cannot be tampered with. And ideally in a heart pacemaker, what is the issue? Uh, in the Turing problem, what is the issue? You wanted to guarantee that uh, whether a particular program hearts. But in the heart pacemaker, you have an opposite problem. You want to ensure that nobody can stop it. It has to be doing the correct thing and it should not stop. Okay? Because if the heart pacemaker stops, then of course, the whole reason why the heart pacemaker exists is gone. Okay? So the thing is, how do you show that the code is correct and never stops? And what is the issue here? Suppose somebody gives you a binary code without source, is it possible to check this property? Okay. And uh, typically what you can assume is that uh, you have some gadget. Okay. For example, the heart pacemaker, it's some kind of a digital device. And let's say that somehow I have uh, capability, electronics capability, by, check and by which I can read the binary from the ROM contents. That is the digital device. I'm able to put some probes, oscilloscopes and whatnot. I'm able to read the binary from this particular device. Okay? Now the question is, given this particular code segments, right, binary, can I figure out what this particular code is doing? Okay? And what is critical for me is, is it possible for me to select some inputs to this particular binary code in a such a way that it reaches a bad state? What's a bad state? For example, the hard pacemaker, uh, basically it is not supplying the appropriate signals to the heart and I've got it into a, some other place in the code where it is uh, doing something, uh, let's say, because it has detected some anomaly and it's stopping. Okay? Basically, because the code has been written by some, let's say, reasonably experienced people. So they're checking for some conditions. And if something bad is likely to happen, they're likely to say, I should not do anything because it is going to worsen the situation. Okay? Suppose uh, by artificially in introducing certain inputs, I'm able to force it to go to this particular state. Actually the state is everything is fine, but an attacker is trying to get it to this particular bad state. Okay? 
So the question is, can I select inputs in such a way that it reaches a batch state? If I'm able to do it, then uh, I can make uh, people who are using heart pacemakers or insulin pumps get into bad situations. Or in the case of nuclear uh, warfare or whatever, I can get people to do the wrong things, okay, which can have catastrophic consequences. Okay? So basically, what is the thing to be checked? Uh, I have some program parts. I want to check if, if as long as there are infeasible parts, okay, then I don't have to worry about it. That is, the, in whatever inputs you give, there is no way that particular part is going to take, uh, let's say, is going to go through those parts. Therefore, it is not an issue. So I can ignore it easily. But suppose there are feasible parts. I want to check if it actually can go through those parts. And I want to see if it is one of those bad parts. That's basically what it is. Our problem is there are too many parts. And uh, so, for example, in any reasonable piece of code, there are a lot of conditionals and loops also. If you take into account all these loops and conditions, the number of possibilities is tremendous, typically, very high. So the problem is there are too many of them. And uh, how do you check that you're not going into any of those parts, which result into a bad part? Okay, that's the issue. Okay. Uh, again, before I proceed, can you see the slide want to, what to check on the top? Because I just uh, moved it some time back. Uh, yes, so, it's visible. Uh, yes. Yeah. So basically, there are too many parts. So there are, uh, basically, what you can do is to do what is called the standard testing. You start uh, taking certain inputs and then keep on checking. Okay, and basically concrete inputs and concrete executions. The real problem with this is that is what is called the coverage problem. That is, uh, the number of possibilities are too huge, and you are uh, how do you know that you have covered all the input space? That's the issue. So there's another possibility called symbolic execution, which we'll discuss for a few minutes now. Uh, this is useful for rare bugs. Okay, but it requires also some uh, powerful tools called uh, SMT solvers. Okay. Uh, and I'll talk about it in a few minutes. And essentially, that's one kind of problem. That is basically the reachability problem has to be checked. I mentioned to me it is equal to the uh, halting problem, but in uh, more tractable cases, at least I can do something about it. Similarly, there are what are called in multi-threaded computations. Uh, basically, when you have multi-core machines, when you have what is called multi-threading, you have issues like what are called race conditions and deadlocks. And also you can have what is called non-transactional behavior in all these kind of cases, it turns out that the behavior can be problematic, basically because you thought you wrote the code in a particular way, but because of the way the multiple threads are interleaved at one time, sometimes you can get unexpected behavior. Okay? Of course, if you write a program which is extremely well thought through and very carefully written, you will think and avoid all these things. But if you think about our current day programs, they are extremely large. For example, if you took, uh, take a look at uh, Google, Chrome, or any such program, it is multi-threaded and uh, it uses Java and those kind of languages. It turns out that it is massive. It's not a small thing. And therefore, to check all the possibilities is going to be extremely difficult. Okay? So it turns out even all this production code, what we normally use, whether it is mailers, whether it is browsers, whatever it is, they have likely to have a lot of bugs in it. Okay? it is, and uh, the people who are writing this code are extremely smart. There's no question about it. In spite of their smartness, it's just that the problem is so massive that there are still bugs in it. And the real problem for us is given that there are so many bugs, we want to look at it first. Okay. So what we can do is uh, typically, if you look at uh, many code sequences, you can uh, find that you have binaries, for example, firmware, and uh, you don't have access to the source code also. So you want to see if you can take the firmware and uh, see if you can disassemble it. Disassemble means what? From the binaries, from zeros and ones, I want to take it to the assembler level. And from slightly, is it possible to go to even higher levels? If you're working with something like Java, it turns out that you can, from the bytecode, you can go to, uh, let's say, slightly higher level, which is somewhat more easier to understand. There are many tools for it. For example, in Android, you have something called APK, MobSF, and Condroid, etc. They do various different kinds of analysis. The real problem for us is that these codes, some of them, for example, if it's a payment application, let's say you are trying to uh, do some transactions using uh, money, for example, then the, the payment applications, they want to make sure that nobody can tamper with it. So they do what is called obfuscation. The obfuscation is what? You rewrite the code in such a way that even if you do the disassembling, you really can't find out much about the code. So the ability to change that code becomes slightly problematic. Okay? 
So that is usually done. But for people who are trying to figure out, is this payment application saved, right? Then at least I have to take their obfuscated code and then I have to reverse it. Okay? That also I have to do. Okay? Because the parties who are writing the code, they have an issue. They don't want uh, random people to go and change their code. So they have a legitimate, uh, uh, let's say, uh, issue. And therefore, their obfuscation is quite understandable why they are doing it. But from the point of view of third party people, they want to be able to ensure that this payment application has no bugs. The developer can say it is uh, foolproof, but I don't, I'm not going to be convinced of it. I want to use my own tools to figure out if that thing is actually foolproof or not. So in a sense, I have to defeat that obfuscation to be able to do analysis. And uh, similarly, uh, one is disassembling, I mentioned there are some tools for it. Similarly, I want to know, I can instrument the code. Okay? And a problem for us is that instrumentation of the code, uh, the cost is an issue because I inc incorporate extra code in it. And also it perturbs the code itself. So for example, if I'm doing some uh, multi-threaded code, it used to be, uh, let's say, scheduling it in a particular way. If I instrument the code, it now the additional code also can cause that uh, particular scheduling to be also changed a bit. So sometimes, uh, if a, the particular program has not been completely and properly analyzed, it can result in new behaviors. So that could perturb the behavior. So that could also be an issue. Okay? So, but at the same time, people have developed certain uh, extensible frameworks. In the hacker world, there are a whole bunch of code. In the research world, there are also different kinds of uh, frameworks that have been developed. For example, in the researcher world, uh, there is a good example I give is something called Roadrunner. Roadrunner is basically a dynamic analysis framework for concurrent programs, for example, for Java programs. Okay? So I will, what I will do is uh, the problem is extremely substantial. So I cannot go through, uh, uh, part of, uh, let's say, the, all of it. So I'll take one single problem and work on it. I'll just give you some ideas about it. Okay? So as I mentioned already, there are countermeasures to analysis. You can do obfuscation. And simple thing is to rename the variables. More complex is use uh, redirections like pointers. And especially, for example, in object-oriented code, we have virtual functions. And usually, if you have used virtual functions, you can uh, you can not directly figure out what functions are being called. You can do more substantial analysis to figure it out, but it takes some effort. Similarly, in the case of Java, you have something called reflection. And what does reflection do? You basically you can figure out what are all the uh, let's say uh, methods you can call, and instead of directly calling the methods, you call it through what is called the reflection interface. So again, just like the object-oriented virtual functions, you use the reflection functions to do it. So again, that also introduces one level of barrier in some sense to figure out easily what functions are being called. As I mentioned to you, you can always figure it out if you do deeper analysis, but it is more complex. Okay? So at the same time, you can also use deeper number theoretic properties. I'll mention this in a few minutes. Okay? So let's, take, let's just take one example of uh, the analysis in dynamic analysis called reachability. Okay? So what is the thing to be done? You take a binary and execute it under controlled conditions, essentially enhanced debugging. We're all familiar with debugging. So it's essentially something more uh, deeper than the regular debugging we're going to do. And what we are going to do is to be able to query execution state. As the, the way I'm going to do uh, this particular reachability analysis, I can stop it at any point, and then I should be able to query the execution state. Okay. There are various ways to do it. Uh, for example, what's called random testing, something called fuzzing is one example. There's an extremely good fuzzing tool called AFL. And in this random testing, you can also have what is called goal-directed models. And nowadays, even machine learning based models. Okay. Again, I will not discuss all this right now. Uh, I will just discuss one important one called symbolic testing, and along with it, a concolic testing. Okay. I will introduce uh, these two things right now. Okay. What is symbolic testing? Uh, the basic thing is that, uh, what is again the problem? You have been given a binary or some kind of firmware. And firmware is everywhere. For example, it's there in your laptop, it is there in your uh, routers, it is there in your mobile, it is there in your power system equipment, it's everywhere. Okay. So the thing is, uh, I want to know whether this thing has any vulnerabilities. That is, can it be hijacked to do something wrong? That's basically what it is. So again, what I can do is, what is symbolic execution is one technique for figuring out what it's doing. Uh, essentially, I told you that I can give it inputs, but I don't have the cannot generate all inputs. It is just too big a problem. I cannot generate all inputs and see for all inputs what happens. So what I want to do is to do what is called symbolic execution. 
by which I don't uh, use this random testing. I use something slightly different. What is this particular technique? Uh, again, I'm, what I'm interested in is controlling the output through inputs. So what I do is, instead of giving concrete inputs, I give it symbolic inputs. And I see how the symbolic input is, uh, what I say, carried through in the code, in the binary, in the firmware. Okay. And uh, I will update the symbolic states as instruction, instructions are executed. And this will be computed concretely where possible. And then every time I come across a branch condition, I keep track of the branch conditions. What is the path? Path is basically a, a product of these branch conditions. Okay. Now, what is the issue for me? I want to know whether given certain inputs, I can reach a bad condition. And basically, the bad condition is now a set of these, uh, let's say, conditions, basically the product of these uh, conditions. Okay? So uh, what I'm interested in is finding out, can I reach a particular bad state? That means, can I uh, look at this product of these uh, branch conditions and then find by some, uh, let's say, technique, whether this particular uh, product of these branch conditions is feasible. Okay? If I can do that, then I know that there is a particular input for which I can get to a bad state. Okay? Again, what is the summary? I will take that particular binary. I will uh, execute it in a controlled manner in a controlled environment. And then what I will do is, as I'm executing it, I keep some symbolic state. And then as I'm executing it, I will be encountering loops and branch conditions and whatnot. As I encounter branch conditions, I keep track of the branch conditions. And then I will keep on doing it till I uh, I'm interested in figuring out how to get to a bad state. Okay? And what is a bad state? It is the uh, starting from the input, starting from the beginning state. I have all these conditions, product of these conditions. If I can get to the bad state, that means that uh, there is a way I can give some inputs by which I can get to the bad state. The whole question now is, is this particular set of branch conditions feasible? And if there is a technique by which I can check the feasibility of these product of these branch conditions, then I can uh, do it. Luckily for us, there is a technique for doing it. It is called, a, sometimes called a theorem prover, or even simpler, what's called a solver, to check if a set of branch conditions, when you do a product of them, is this true or not? Okay. For example, uh, if you look at this, let's take the password example. Uh, sometimes some password uh, programs, you know, the party who wrote it, can be very sneaky and they want a particular name to be uh, able to log in without any password. Okay, so for example, I'm just summarizing the whole uh, uh, password program in a very simple way, name. If name equal to sneaky, login is successful. That is, you don't even have to put the password. Otherwise, you go through the regular password kind of uh, method. Okay, so the thing is, this is the code. And I, I just have only a binary procedure. Okay? I, I just have a binary code. And this is quite common, for example, routers. Suppose you have a router, oftentimes they will say, if name equal to uh, admin equal to this, right? One, two, three, then you let the router do whatever. You can get into the router and change the parameters, right? Some of you might be aware that most often routers have uh, default parameters, default, uh, uh, let's say, um, passwords. And uh, you want to know what the password is. Okay? So what is the symbolic tech analysis do? Let's say that by the time you get to just before this particular statement, the state of the program is something called state, right? And then there is a branch condition here. So you can see there is a branch condition out here. If name equal to equal to sneaky, then you go to the left, otherwise you go to the right. So what is the branch condition? When you go to the left, it is the state before you started this condition and name equal to equal to sneaky. So this basically now you can see a condition has become bigger. The state itself is a lot of conditions because you could have come to that by multiple branch conditions. Okay? So state itself is a product of multiple, uh, let's say, propositions or uh, logical conditions. And they've added this particular uh, condition also. So all these things are now one big condition. Now, at this point, suppose I'm able to access this, right? both these two conditions. I give it to a, what is called a theorem prover or a solver. Ask it, is it feasible, this particular set of conditions? If this particular set of conditions is possible, then I know that I know a particular input by which I can get to that particular state. Okay? So 
So essentially, the important thing to notice is that I don't know anything about this code. I just have a binary, and it is, uh, let's say, from the binary, I'm able to figure out if there's a solution to this, then I can do it, okay? Uh, then I can figure out what those inputs are, okay? And uh, an example of that kind of framework, I think some of you might have come across, is called Anger. This is one of the platforms. It is basically a binary analysis framework, and it is a Python uh, libraries. It has many capabilities, symbolic execution being one of them. And it also does something called decompilation, value set analysis, etc. I think you may not have time to go through all these things, but I just want to look at symbolic execution. So this is the program written in C, and this is what happens in the case of uh, Anger. Okay. So basically, you uh, if you look at, can you see my pointer? Is it possible to see the pointer? And moving the pointer. Uh, yes, it is possible. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. So basically, you start a project called uh, uh, Sneaky, for example. You get into the program execution, and then uh, you are essentially saying there is a path here. Okay. You start executing. Path group is uh, the number of paths that are available at any point in time. And basically, what it's saying is that if the number of paths is greater than or equal to one, then the left path is this, and the right path is this. Essentially, you can. Club multiple paths also, but I'm just saying for simplicity here, I'm only taking care of the left path and the right path, and I have access to these paths. Okay, now I can examine this particular uh, uh, set of paths. Okay, I can see what is this particular path. I take this path, basically a set of uh, binary conditions. Uh, basically, this path also will incorporate the binary conditions. Now I take that path. I can get a dump of it. I can give it to a, a theorem prover or a solver and ask it to solve it. And if it finds a solution, then I found a set of inputs by which I can get to that part. Okay? So, uh, in a sense, I'm able to uh, make some uh, progress in trying to figure out if I can get to a particular, uh, it's a bad state. Okay? Uh, basically, by systematically using uh, this analysis framework to find out what inputs will get me to those kind of bad states. Okay? And real problem with this kind of a solution is that uh, you have loops, and therefore, if your loops uh, iterate for a long, long time, the number of conditions that are incorporated also will grow along with the number of iterations. Okay? For example, if you are doing iterations one million times, you will get a condition which is with one million uh, uh, conditions, okay? and you have to solve it. And that means that somebody who solves it, it has to be super fast, and uh, it is not going to be, uh, let's say, easy to solve a very large problem. And it turns out it may also be not possible to solve it in polynomial time. Okay, that is a reasonable amount of time. I'll come to that in a minute. There's also other issue that it is what is called non-deterministic code. Okay? That means that you might not be able to uh, predict everything because sometimes inputs are available at one time. Sometimes you have operating system calls that also acts lots of difficulty. You also have non-linear operations and your solver might not be able to solve it if there are non-linear operations. That also is an issue. So as I mentioned, you have these solvers and uh, uh, it turns out for seeing if there is a solution to this uh, uh, branch conditions, that is you take a product of branch conditions, I want to see if there is a solution which satisfies these branch conditions, all of them, right? There is something called conjunctive normal form. Uh, and the thing is that it turns out it is a, what is called an NP complete problem. That is to solve this is an NP complete problem. That means that uh, in principle, it's an exponential problem, okay? So you can see that uh, in theory, the symbolic analysis will help you, but in practice, you might be, uh, it might be difficult because of this explosion of state cases, okay, states, the explosion of number of possibilities that you have to enumerate. Okay? So there is another solution, it's called concolic, concolic testing, which can uh, mix both symbolic as well as uh, a concrete solution. I mentioned to you that in the beginning, testing is about using concrete inputs and checking out whether you hit the bad state. In uh, concolic testing, what you're doing is you're taking symbolic testing plus concolic testing. Okay? The reason is that, as I mentioned to you, SMT solvers may not be effective, basically because oftentimes the, they might just say that, I don't know some uh, set of conditions, whether it can be made to be true or false, I have no idea. That's what the SMT solvers can come back to you. Okay? So especially you can also have nonlinear equations I mentioned to you, and an easy way to think about it is, I think recently you know that Parma's theorem has been uh, shown to be, uh, that conjecture has to be shown to be true. But uh, I can, uh, in principle, I can say, for example, if x to the power of 4 plus y to the power of 4 equals z to the power of 4, 
okay do something otherwise do something else right and uh, to know that this particular thing is feasible or not only in 1990s we figured figured out that it is possible i can come up with some other examples for which nobody knows the solution nobody knows whether the particular conjecture is true or false right so i can uh, essentially smt solvers can only work in limited domains therefore it doesn't work out very well so the one solution people have proposed is what is called uh, concolic testing it basically has lower coverage but it can work around the problems of this uh, smt solvers what uh, okay so again what you can do is uh, uh, you take a set of random inputs as before and execute them suppose you uh, execute you can encounter these conditions d1 condition v2 condition let's say bn is the last condition okay what you can do is suppose this is the last condition suppose i want to examine other parts in the code okay what i will do is i will negate the last condition bn okay and how can i negate it because i mentioned that i am executing this uh, binary under in a controlled environment like anger so one of those i mentioned this a python framework in which some binary is given to it and we are executing it in that framework anger framework and that anger framework will give me complete uh, let us say accessibility at a programming level to be able to stop it at wherever in whatever form i want to to stop it and examine the set of states i am presently in right now okay so in a sense what i can do is i will ask it to execute it and let's say that executed uh, it has gone through certain paths and i am not comfortable about the input space i explore i mentioned to you that the coverage of input space can be problematic right because i don't know how to generate all the inputs and check all the inputs to see if there's any possibility of getting into a bad state so what i'm going to do right now is take some uh, random inputs it will go to some let's say end state and it turns out to be not a bad state okay so uh, that's fine but now i want to get to other states right i want to check if other states are bad states what do i do i already reached the end state bn i will do what i do is this for bn i will negate it instead of bn i'll say not not bn now i will take the same conditions b1 b2 b2 bn minus 1 and now i ask and with not bn okay that is i negate only the last condition and give that whole set of conditions to again my theorem solver the theorem prover or the solver ask it is it feasible what am i getting out of this in the previous case i explored the path from b1 to bn now i am going to check a new path bn up till bn is 1 followed by not a bn uh, not a b so it's a new path okay i'll see if there's any feasible solution if there's a feasible solution then i found a new set of inputs which will take another condition okay now again i repeat the same thing i go to instead of bn and not bn i go to bn minus 1 and not bn minus 1 again i can systematically keep going up and so in a sense i can essentially look at almost all the cases in in case my solvers are able to solve those uh, conditions okay so uh, so that's what the concolic testing is all about so again to outline the algorithm is what input the variables symbolic or concrete and choose random input execute the program symbolically re execute the program and you negate the last condition check whether it is solvable if so explore new branch go back to again negate condition you keep on doing it if for some reason i am unable to solve it i go back to again choosing a random input and trying it okay i am executing it so you should go to this one sorry choose random input Okay. I made a mistake. You should not go to. You should go to this part. I should choose a random input and do it. Okay. Okay. So this is basically what is called concolic testing. The only real issue for us is that again, a first case is an issue, and uh, uh, essentially, I can uh, you can use deep mathematics to prevent analysis. And why is this important? Because reverse engineering of code is important in industry. And uh, another reason is that you know that JavaScript is. Uh, uh, widely used on the web and the code that uh, when you go to a website it uh, javascript is loaded to your system and uh, you might essentially by looking at the code you might know what uh, the server is uh, what the server code is like okay so people would like to uh, uh, let's say first get that code also okay so there are uh, issues that uh, are to be resolved in case you really want to do analysis okay i'll give you an example of how people can uh, make uh, analysis difficult you might have heard about this problem called 3x plus 1 problem what is this uh, it's basically uh, an extremely simple problem what is it it is saying that given any number n you check if n equal to 1 if n equal to 1 you return 
otherwise if n is not equal to 1 you check if it's e1 if it's e1 then it is you divide that number by 2 and then recursively call f x okay otherwise if it's not e1 you call that function recursively with 3 and plus 1 okay now i can ask uh, what is called the halting problem for this particular problem for an arbitrary n does f of n terminate okay now it turns out nobody has solved this particular problem okay nobody knows for an arbitrary n whether this particular function always stops okay and uh, famous mathematicians like ergas for example they said that mathematics is not yet ready for such problems okay so uh again diagrammatically uh, this is what is called a collax problem and uh, people have tested it up till 2 to the power of 66 okay so it seems to start from any number here it turns out almost almost invariably it comes to 1 uh, that is all the numbers up till now were been tested 2 to the power of 66 okay so but uh, in principle nobody still knows whether it is valid for all n okay so people have used uh, this particular obfuscation to combat symbolic execution For example, suppose you are doing this, right? As I mentioned, if x equal to 30 or equal to what we looked at before, if the input is uh, for password purposes, if uh, name is equal to sneaky, then I want to uh, log in directly without password, right? So it turns out I can rewrite this piece of code. You can you see the pointer to the left, a, right? I can rewrite to the code like this using this uh, collapse problem. Okay, this is a collapse problem. What we just discussed before that given any n. Whether uh, it halts, right? And I can rewrite it this way, and essentially it turns out this x equal to thirty, for example, here is essentially equal to this particular problem. Okay. Of course, I've introduced an extra variable called y. Okay. Uh, and this y is basically that collapse problem, which I have mentioned to you. Theoretically, nobody knows the answer, but it halts for everything all the way up to two to the power of sixty-six. Who are asking this? Okay. So essentially, I have obfuscated the program. So that instead of this, it turns out to be this. Now, if I give it to the my analysis, this uh, let us say symbolic analysis, it turns out to be this is going to be extremely difficult for it. So that's one thing which is the issue here. Basically, that people can incorporate a fascination to create problems. Okay? So in a sense, there are many theoretical limitations for this kind of problems. Uh, uh, reachability, I mentioned to you. There's also what is called the Rice theorem. Okay, it basically says that any semantic property. right uh, it typically is undecidable okay and similarly in many dynamic analysis problems for example race conditions it is known to be np hard that means an extremely hard problem and uh, so these are all very hard problems again you might have also thought about viruses and the viruses are an example of uh, code for which uh, there are many ways to figure it out but in principle a uh, virus uh, cannot be completely and totally accurately determined to be a virus okay there are interesting uh, ways of writing viruses in which you cannot really show whether a particular piece of code is a virus or not okay because it comes from deep theory uh, again i think i may not have time to go through it but uh, essentially virus detection is undecidable okay that's basically the result and uh, i think because of lack of time i think i want to avoid this but i will give it diagrammatically so basically there is a theorem which uh, has been proven by cohen that if this is the set of viruses right all this black dots to say whether a particular program is a uh, is a can function as a virus or not okay these are all the viruses the white ones these ones can you see the uh, uh, my mouse sorry my uh, mouse yes yes okay. so the white ones are basically non viruses okay okay so to put a demarcation between a viruses which are the black ones and the non virus one this is impossible okay similarly there is something called polymorphism there are varieties varieties of uh, viruses this is one type of variety of virus this uh, with the triangles and there is one type of variety which is the circles it turns out it's even impossible to figure out if a uh, particular virus is of this type whether it is a triangle type or whether it is a circle type or whether it is a hexagon type okay so there are some interesting uh, results again all these things are similar to the halting problem okay so essentially what's happening is that all these things show that uh, determining certain properties is not easy whether something is safe for us whether its particular uh, pace maker will never stop okay all these kind of things are very difficult it can only be done by uh, through some engineering approximation again you might have heard about this buffer overflow attacks basically 
you get what is called elevated privileges. That is, you uh, send certain types of inputs by which you trick the program to, uh, let us say, take a different uh, path in the code by overflowing certain arrays. Okay? There are certain arrays on the stack and by giving certain inputs which are much longer than expected, they essentially can go and write on the program counter. And therefore, you can hijack the control flow. Okay? And uh, it turns out this buffer overflow problems uh, also need to be checked out. It turns out this can also be translated as a reachability problem. So as I mentioned, reachability problem in principle is very difficult. It is equal to halting problem. But it turns out uh, uh, for many programs which are of interest to us, uh, there are certain tools that have been developed. A good example is Mayhem, which essentially takes this buffer overflow problem and translates it into a reachability problem. And basically, in some sense, it says whether the program counter is equal to some stack location. Uh, is my current program location is it equivalent to some value on the program counter on the stack? Okay. So I check that condition. I mentioned to you that uh, I can give it to a theorem prover or a solver, saying that whether I can reach this particular state. So what happens is that whether uh, my program counter is some value on the stack can be taken as a condition, and then I will take all the branch conditions along with this condition a program counter equal to some value on the stack and give it to the solver and ask it if it's soluble. And if it is soluble, then I know that there is a buffer overflow. Okay. So in a sense, there are some tools that have been developed which also can do this. Similarly, there are something called heap attacks by which you can do just like the buffer overflow attacks on the stack, you can also do those kind of things in a heap. It turns out to be that there are no proper tools still available for this. And uh, a lot of people are starting to work on this. One of my own students also looking at this particular. There's a similar thing called value set analysis. I'm just giving you the kind of problems that, uh, that need to be solved. Essentially for the heap and uh, stack analysis, <clears throat> I need to know of the binaries, which parts are uh, heap and which parts are uh, stack. And for that, there's something called value set analysis. And uh, it turns out this also is a non-trivial program which has to be solved. And people usually use it. Uh, uh, basically what happens is that a typical program when it dies, uh, you have what is called a backtrace or a core dump, and then people will take the core dump and analyze it, okay? And do what is called root cause analysis. And then uh, uh, from that, I, they can want to figure out what are the stack areas, what are the heap areas, what are the data regions. And they use something called backward taint analysis. And it turns out this problem also is non-trivial. And nowadays people are starting to use machine learning or data, uh, deep learning uh, techniques for doing this, okay? Again, I'm not just uh, mentioning some of the issues because of the lack of time I cannot go through all of them. It turns out even concurrent libraries, uh, for example, Java, there are many bugs that are possible. And uh, it turns out <clears throat> to detect these bugs, you have to do directed search. It uses multiple techniques like concolic testing, constraint solving, static analysis, all kinds of techniques together. And it is a non-trivial thing. Basically, you have to force that particular, uh, you know, your analysis tool to go to certain regions of the code where it is likely to show these bugs. <coughs> and this, some of this kind of work was done in our department by some of our colleagues here. Mm -hmm. And I just mentioned, I'll just give you one or two examples uh, of the kind of frameworks that are available right now. There is a framework called Roadrunner for Java that is available. And uh, that can be uh, used for multi-threaded Java. And uh, many analysis can be uh, is incorporated into this framework. And you can compare them. You can also compose them. Okay? Not only compare across to see which one is better, which one can handle more cases. Not only can you compare, but also you can compose them. You, for example, there's a technique called happens before because when you have multi-threading, essentially it is a distributed program. So you need to know which event happens and which happens later. And uh, so how to get those, uh, let's say, uh, uh, relationships across various events in the code that is done by happens before. So you can also have uh, uh, locks and uh, multiple threading. <coughs> How to combine lock analysis with uh, what is called thread local analysis, et cetera. So all these things can also be composed. So this is a promising framework. Uh, I think I don't have time, but I'll just briefly mention. Can you see the diagram? Yes, yes. Okay, so this is a roadrunner thing. Basically you have Java bytecode. Instrumenter code, you have abstract state. Instrumented bytecode comes from instrumented. 
And then your Roadrunner, there you have done the various, uh, uh, let's say, it has a monitor which basically spits out the events in the code. Okay. And then you use a backend tool where you incorporate your analysis. Okay. And then uh, your analysis will tell you that this race condition has a deadlock and whatnot. Okay. So uh, there are many types of analysis that can be done on this. Uh, again, you can see, for example, uh, 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 for example, for uh, detecting automaticity violations, for detecting serializability errors, for detecting races, okay, etc. Okay, for uh, doing, uh, uh, for example, can you have deadlocks to uh, because of uh, using locks, okay, etc. There are various kinds of analysis that can be. Okay. So essentially, if you look at dynamic analysis, the scope is quite large. For scalable software, you need it for multi-threading, for memory models. For reliable software, uh, you want to check for races, deadlocks, autonomy violations, et cetera. Okay? And also for secure software also. Okay? Basically, you want to check for buffer overflow, SQL injection, obfuscation, et cetera. Okay? Again, uh, I'll just briefly, I'm going to conclude in a few minutes. Uh, it turns out this problem is uh, even worse now because, uh, uh, for example, I have Android. You can do what's called repackaging. That is, you take an application on the Play Store and repackage it as a new one. Okay? And basically add uh, advertisements or your malicious. And this comes out with quite a serious problem. Okay? And uh, okay, I think I don't have time to go through this. Okay, So basically, uh, what I'd like to say is that uh, just like uh, uh, in arms control, the issue of uh, verifying if your uh, attacker or your, uh, you know, your uh, competitor or your adversary has some capability of a particular specific type, right? But he can claim that I can do this. Suppose you don't listen to me, I'll do this to you, right? Uh, if that's the case, I want to know whether I can check whether that particular person has the particular capability, right? That turns out to be non-trivial. Similarly, in code also, we have the same issue. Suppose somebody says that I'm going to, let us say, enter your email system and I can create havoc in your email system and without anybody knowing that I did it. Okay. Suppose I claim that I have this kind of capability. Or, uh, then how do you check that that capability is there? It turns out that this requires code analysis of some kind. Okay? And so essentially your ability to trust somebody depends on your verification. Okay? And this verification is in principle, uh, in its pure theoretical uh, context, it is an unsolvable problem. That means that you have to fall back on engineering uh, let's analysis, engineering types of analysis, where you can show for most of the cases Yes, I can show that this is the case. So now your ability to, let's say, <coughs> compete with somebody or compete with an adversary depends on how good your analysis techniques is. Okay. So in a sense, uh, it boils down to your capabilities of um, code analysis. Okay. And uh, I think some of you might have heard about many of this, uh, let's say, uh, uh, crypto coins, right? There are various exchanges. And suddenly you hear that one particular crypto coin exchange got, uh, let's say, attacked and then all the money disappeared, okay? And how does it happen? It happens because in spite of the uh, extremely careful, let's say, program that has been done, there could be some bugs in the, uh, at certain uh, levels, which are not available at a abstract level. And using that, they might have uh, done certain things by which uh, you know, the Bitcoins have been stolen and whatnot. Okay. So those kind of things happen. And therefore, in a sense, what is critical is that uh, I need to be able to analyze uh, embedded devices from them with unknown binaries. And this is becoming even a bigger problem with uh, what is called internet of things. And uh, even bigger issue nowadays is if you buy equipment from country X, do I know that the equipment is clean or not? Okay. That's an issue. And so essentially this become an extremely important problem. And uh, any work that can throw light on this into the post. I think I would stop at this point. If you have any questions. I'll yes, thank you so thank much you. Uh, for your insightful presentation. There are some questions already. Uh, the first one uh, has to do with uh, the pacemaker case uh, you mentioned in the beginning. So yes. can digitally signed programs be a way to mitigate the risk of accessing the code in the case of the pacemaker? Um, Basically, if you sign it, uh, then basically what you are guaranteeing is that it is, the code is not modified. Okay. Okay. That's, particular, that's fine. But suppose your inputs, right? that means the code is fine. 
but suppose i am able to use inputs for which the programmer did not know that these for this inputs it goes into back state okay then even signing is not going to help you for example uh, your chrome right your chrome is uh, sent by uh, let's say developed by google one of the best companies in the world and even chrome has bugs because why is there why is there a bug because in spite of the best software tools and the best people working on it they not been able to remove the bug from it right so there is an input for which there is a bug suppose that bug is turns out to be a bad bug that means it has some serious ramifications okay so our issue there is precisely that that your code on the pacemaker could be signed but the writer of the code could cannot guarantee that it will reach a bad state okay, with certain inputs okay, that's the issue i hope i answered the question did i uh yes uh well uh, the, the next one also has to do with uh, the pacemaker yeah. and whether uh, in the case that the heart pacemaker is uh, tampered with by an external party uh, will this have any uh, legal repercussions for the person that tampered it okay the thing is i'm assuming that tampering is now through inputs okay so there are various ways to do it uh, for example uh, some of you might have heard that uh, by sending a particular uh, uh, let's say uh, input sequence certain iphones uh, uh, let's say stop working right so you might have heard of this kind of things right yeah so basically uh, i think that if those kind of things happen i think the liability of course is with the with the party who developed that software and the party who has uh, for example if apple is a, a company which has given out this particular thing uh, gadget and you are able to somebody some hacker some uh, person with the wrong ideas sends a particular vulnerability because he knows that the vulnerability exists he sends a particular uh, its input sequence by that particular uh, iphone gets uh, stuck up in some mode it is not you cannot use it for that i'm pretty sure that the liability is with the party who sent it not with the i think the criminal intent uh, if somebody dies i guess then the party who sent it may i think one can probably uh, say is responsible but i think uh, you cannot determine that it's malicious intent right i could have uh, uh, not knowingly sent that particular input sequence right there's no way to say but i think uh, uh, not to clear what the international regulations are here but i would uh, not knowing all the legal issues i would yes. hold the software developer responsible first and then if it malicious intent then i will uh, uh, if malicious intent can be established the party who sent that could or input sequence that's what i mean but these are all difficult Imagine yes <laughs> clear um and the next question has to do uh says that uh whether the code uh obfuscation is a good way for securing sensitive code programs uh i think you uh, basically the problem with uh, code obfuscation is that there are theoretical results which show that uh, there is no perfect d of the code obfuscation just like there are uh, issues about uh, reachability etc there are issues about perfect obfuscation and perfect deobfuscation neither things are in principle possible okay? that means that uh, there is always something which a more clever guy can figure out to outsmart the other party so it's always a, a let's say a game between the attacker and attack so uh, i think what people are doing especially because see in the android Uh, for example payment apps situation the more recent apps they are using uh, obfuscation or what is called anti uh, repackaging okay what they are doing is to make sure that if somebody tries to modify it and execute it then uh, it is not runnable even in a virtual environment you cannot run it they, they uh, ensure that it is uh, not possible to run it so in a sense you want to make it what's called a dead brick that is uh, the code cannot just run just so that you are safe from the point of view okay so uh, anti uh, uh, repackaging mechanisms is what people are using and uh, one way to do anti repackaging is to obfuscate so that nobody knows what the code is to be okay uh, but the issue is that uh, in a payment applications i know exactly what is going on right i it's supposed to be between uh, two parties one is paying one party right so in a sense i have some idea of what a payment application should be supposed to be. i have some idea okay? So using that idea, I can actually attack that obfuscation. Okay. 
So people have figured out uh, what can those kind of uh, high level ideas about how to uh, give on some uh, elementary semantics where to look for to uh, defeat that obfuscation. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, well, we are out of time, but maybe uh, with your own consent, we can have five more minutes for questions. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so the next question uh, says, um, is DPA for uh, is it DPA for high-end cyber physical systems, or or can we use uh, can it be used in simple web-based application? DPA for cyber physical systems. Yes. See, with the cyber physical system, the issue becomes even more complex because, for example, I can uh, I'm dealing with uh, not only uh, logical fragments in the code. Uh, uh, you know, perfect numbers, perfect, uh, you know, binary numbers and whatnot. In the real world, I'm also dealing with unlock quantities, right? In a cyber physical system, I'm, I'm assuming that you are connecting to uh, real systems, for example, voltages and frequencies and all those things. So uh, essentially, I can uh, have situations in cyber physical systems where the sensors can uh, intentionally give you wrong results every so often, right? How do I know that the sensors are not cheating? Okay. So I need to figure out, is there a way to uh, uh, find out which sensors are working reliably, which sensors are doing Byzantine uh, behavior, et cetera. So, and that would, this is in the context of voltages and frequencies and all these uh, real value things. Okay. Uh, uh, so some people have, there are some solutions for this. Basically they uh, send out certain uh, waveforms onto these kind of systems, and then see what is the, uh, let's say, the returned waveform. And then see from that, uh, they, they see whether there's any uh, uh, subtle modification that people are doing uh, to these unlocked waveforms. And then uh, from there, they can, uh, um, let's see, essentially you send out a waveform, and then it is some kind of a transform. The transformation is taking place on the waveform. You analyze the waveform, return back, and see if anybody has injected anything other than what you thought should be there. Okay. So there are approaches by which you can, of course, there are uh, beginning to, uh, people are starting to do this in the last uh, uh, few years. I don't think it has come to the stage where somebody can confidently say that I have ways of, uh, let's say, analyzing the system and telling you whether uh, the system, cyber physical system is, uh, let's say, immune to those kind of attacks. That it doesn't, as far as I know, it has not happened. Uh, thank you. And maybe a last question. Uh, is there any software suggestions which can help uh, to avoid reverse engineering of code? Is there any what? I'm sorry. I didn't uh, software suggestions. OK. I think uh, if you want to avoid reverse engineering, the standard technique is uh, deobfuscation. And uh, essentially, you. Uh, because any piece of code, you can always attach a uh, oscilloscope or some probe to get the binary patterns that are coming out. Okay. So in principle, you can always get some information. It's going to be maybe difficult, but you can always get something out. Okay. Whether that's enough to uh, do some uh, attacks on the system, that is going to be purely the skill of the person and how hard the problem is, and all those things you cannot say anything about right now. But uh, essentially, if you want to avoid reverse engineering, the standard thing is to obfuscate. I've given an example by which they use that collapse problem to obfuscate. But the problem with uh, those kind of obfuscation is that your code also gets slowed down. So you have to find out some, uh, uh, some kind of intermediate solutions which are not costly. And uh, you can also do, for example, Oftentimes people do encryption and decryption. That is, you have a secret key, and uh, which is in the code itself. Okay? Uh, but where it is kept in the code is uh, not very clear. Okay? And so you do encryption and decryption of the values. So uh, unless you know where the key is in the code, you have you'll have a hard time figuring out what's happening. Uh, so even viruses do the same thing. You know, if you look at viruses, they do a lot of this. Uh, uh, compression techniques and signing techniques and uh, encryption techniques uh, to make sure the virus is not uh, analyzable. So, uh, so all these techniques are done. Uh, but the problem is that uh, if you have some key, 
in principle it will be available in memory somewhere and uh, a clever guy can with a certain attack can figure it out and that's what happened with the dvds and uh, uh, for example dvds supposedly there was some kind of a, uh, let's say uh, encryption scheme unbreakable encryption scheme but unfortunately because it goes as a, uh, the, it's a physical device the key for decoding that thing actually has to be in the dvd itself so okay master key okay and that will be if you uh, execute that dvd code it will be available in memory so somebody uh, i'm just giving you a very crude uh, uh, analysis of what happened um, somebody finally figured out where the key is and they were able to break the dvd encryption completely so in principle uh, it can be done but it requires extraordinary good engineering to defeat the most determined adversary it's not easy <laughs>